Anti-China rhetoric in the U.S. has become so common that it even found its way into the midterm elections. In an online ad that ran in March, Tim Ryan, the Democratic Party Senate candidate in Ohio, repeatedly blamed China for pink slips and price increases that harm American workers, saying it is us versus China. A new report shows that at least 1,400 U.S.-based ethnic Chinese scientists switched their professional affiliation last year from American to Chinese institutions as the political climate in the U.S. turned more hostile. Another report shows that during the first half of 2022, U.S. student visas issued to Chinese nationals plummeted more than 50% compared to pre-pandemic levels. The coupling between the two largest economies in the world is not only happening, but accelerating. Why is this happening? Who will be hurt more? Who can stop it? What does it mean for the global economy and your money? Hi, I'm David Wu, a former Wall Street strategist with a 20-year track record of making actionable predictions about major global change. Welcome to The Money Game, where I take on groupthink, propaganda, and conspiracy theories in my critical analysis of markets, economics, and politics. Before we begin, please hit Subscribe and the bell button so that you will be notified when a new video comes out. Politicians sometimes mean what they say when there's a sense of great crisis, when there is much at stake. Churchill's famous, we shall fight on the beaches speech, given in June 1940, is a good example of such a moment of clarity in British and European history. The world is once again on the cusp of a great conflict. Over the past month, a report a couple of speeches, and even an essay by the leaders of the main protagonists of the conflict provide a rare glimpse into their worldviews and calculations. This is not to say that we should take everything these politicians said in these public statements as absolute truths, but they could well be truths as they see them. Regardless of whether you agree with what was said, the key is that we can learn much about the collision course that they are embarking on and why. In theory, this understanding can help us anticipate their next moves and gain some visibility into the future. That is, of course, if you care to look into a future that does not look very pleasant. For professional investors and corporate decision makers, unfortunately, you don't have too much of a choice. If there's anything that the protagonists of the new great conflict can agree on, is that we are at a momentous time in history. In a national security strategy report released by the White House last month, Joe Biden declared that the world is at an inflection point. Xi Jinping, in his opening speech at the 20th Party Co Congress, stated that the world has entered a new period of turbulence and change. Vladimir Putin, in his speech at the accession ceremony for Donbas Zaporozhye in Kherson, pronounced, the world has entered a period of a fundamental revolutionary transformation. What do these men mean by change, transformation, and inflection point? Biden summarized it for us in one sentence. We are in the midst of a strategic competition to shape the future of the international order, he wrote in the introduction of his National Security Strategy Report. Strategic competition is a whitewashed term for power struggle. For the U.S. to shape the future of the international order is just a code for defending the unipolar world order with the U.S. as the dominant power against the challenge of a multipolar world with potentially many power centers. But why this sense of urgency? Biden spelled it out the reason. He wrote, China has both the intent to reshape the international order and increasingly the economic, diplomatic, military, and technological power to do it. There is more. Biden claimed that Beijing has the ambition to become the world's leading power. In other words, the U.S. is concerned that China is aiming to replace the U.S. at the top of the food chain. Biden explained why the U.S. cannot allow this to happen. He wrote, autocrats are working overtime to undermine democracy and export a model of governance marked by repression at home and cohesion abroad. What does China think about all this? Xi, in his speech at the 20th National Party Congress, responded that no matter what stage of development it reaches, China will never seek hegemony or engage in expansionism. Xi goes into great length in his speech to explain that China respects the sovereignty and territorial integrity of all countries and that the development of paths and social systems independently chosen by all the world's people. 
He said that China stands firmly against all forms of hegemonism and interference in other countries' internal affairs. Here lies the main disagreement between the U.S. and China. The U.S. is accusing China of plotting to take over the world so that it can export its political system to everywhere else, including the United States. Biden says that the need to stop China is why the need for American leadership is as great as it ever been. He says that there is no nation better positioned to lead with strength and purpose than the United States of America. She says the ambition the U.S. is ascribing to it is at odds with its fundamental principles of peaceful coexistence. That on the contrary, China is committed to expanding global partnerships based on equality, openness and cooperation and broadening the convergence of interests with other countries. Who do you believe? The U.S. or China? Putin, on his part, is not shy about exposing what he believes to be America's real agenda. In his speech, Putin claims the U.S. is motivated by its objective to preserve the neo-colonial system, which allows it to live off the world, to plunder it thanks to the domination of the U.S. dollar and technology, to collect an actual tribute from humanity, to extract its primary source of unearned prosperity as the rent paid to the hegemon. Whether you agree with Putin or not about what motivates U.S. foreign policy, there is no denying that the U.S. is the biggest beneficiary of the current unipolar world order. Biden has some harsh words for Russia in his report and explained why his administration is working to make Russia's war on Ukraine a strategic failure. Biden accuses Russia of pursuing an imperialist foreign policy with the goal of overturning key elements of the international order and interfering brazenly in U.S. politics and working to sow divisions among the American people. Biden also accuses Russia of engaging in reckless nuclear threats that endanger the global non-proliferation regime. Putin, in his speech, reminded his audience of the use of nuclear weapons by the U.S. against Japan, in the U.S. carpet bombings, and the U.S. use of napalm and chemical weapons in Korea and Vietnam. He accuses the U.S. of reneging on promises not to expand NATO to the east and unilaterally terminating the Anti-Missile Defense Treaty and the Intermediate Range Missile Treaty, the two cornerstones of the nuclear non-proliferation agreements between the U.S. and the Soviet Union under far-fetched pretext. Who's telling the truth, Putin or Biden? I don't think it really matters. What matters is that the U.S. has decided that it's got so much at stake in the present unipolar, rule-based world order that it cannot afford to take any chances. That is why Biden wrote, we will not leave our future vulnerable to the whims of those who do not share our vision for a world that is free, open, prosperous, and secure. The objective set out in the National Security Strategy Report is to prioritize maintaining an enduring competitive edge over China while constraining a still profoundly dangerous Russia. How does the U.S. plan to maintain a competitive edge over China? A week before the National Security Strategy Report was released, the U.S. announced its toughest export control ever by restricting China's ability to obtain advanced computing chips and manufacturing equipment for advanced semiconductors. This policy is clearly designed to slow China's development in semiconductors, quantum computing, and artificial intelligence. Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google, called China a full-spectrum peer competitor in the area of artificial intelligence. A recent Harvard University report on the U.S.-China tech rivalry concluded that China has already surpassed the U.S. in quantum communication and has rapidly narrowed America's lead in quantum computing. U.S. policy to deny China access to advanced semiconductors made by the U.S. sometime, but it will come at a great cost to the U.S. and its allies. China accounts for 40 percent of the world's consumption of semiconductors. Preventing U.S. chip companies from selling to China means lower revenue, lower profit, lower R&D budget, and thus lower ability to maintain their technological edge over China. It is expected that the sanctions on semiconductor sales to China is likely to be followed by other measures after the U.S. midterms. Many in Washington are advocating economic decoupling from China as a way to slow China's growth. 
However, for these policies to succeed in holding China back, the U.S. will need cooperation from all of its allies. Among U.S. allies, Japan and Germany are the largest in terms of the size of their economies. The problem for these countries is not only that they both have an export-oriented economic model, but that China is their biggest export market. This means economic decoupling from China will be very painful for them. So painful, in fact, that German Chancellor Olaf Scholz's decision to visit China last week, reportedly despite U.S. opposition, was so significant. Scholz was the first Western leader to visit China after she won his third term. In an essay for Politico.com on the eve of his trip, Scholz wrote that China remains an important business and trading partner for Germany and Europe, and we don't want to decouple from it. Moreover, he wrote that new centers of power are emerging in a multipolar world, and we aim to establish and expand partnerships with all of them. Finally, he emphasized that of all the countries in the world, Germany, which had such a painful experience of division during the Cold War, has no interest in seeing new blocs emerge in the world. It is safe to assume that these words probably didn't gain Schultz any new friends in Washington. Will Japan follow Germany's lead to reject economic decoupling with China? The Vice President of Global Policy at the American Semiconductor Industry Association recently commented that there is an urgent need for America's allies to come on board soon to try and ensure that U.S. companies don't bleed out market shares to their foreign competitors. The foreign competitors he's referring to are likely allies like Japan and Korea. Another major U.S. ally is the U.K. A leaked Treasury document in July suggested that Rishi Sunak, the new Prime Minister, was close to signing a new economic agreement with China earlier this year that aimed to deepen trade links and make the UK the market of choice for Chinese companies. Meanwhile, it has been rightly reported that Saudi Arabia will soon formally apply to join the BRICS group. America is still the largest economy in the world, with the most powerful army and best research institutions. However, it is clear from the signals from American allies that there is a resistance to the American pursuit to isolate and weaken China. History tells us it is futile to hold back the tide of change. Embarking on an effort to do so is a dangerous gamble that could backfire. Instead, the U.S. should use its leverage and clout to level the playing field with China. A good model would be the phase one trade agreement negotiated by the Trump administration that succeeded in getting serious concessions from Beijing on financial services, currency, agriculture, trade barriers, and IP protection. Unfortunately, the rivalry between the U.S. and China have been so politicized over the last few years that we might have reached a point of no return to a pragmatic resolution. Prepare for the worst. If you got something out of this program, please hit like and subscribe to my free YouTube channel. If you want to learn more about my investment strategy, come check us out at davidwuunbound.com. Thank you for listening.